Is it wrong for a boss to have sex with an employee, given the power differentials and the potential for problems? Even if it's mutual attraction, should the boss be expected to say no? Barnaby? I, I wonder who that was directed to. Um, <laughs> the answer is no. Uh, and, the, and this is where I'm way out of line with so, you know, corporate Australia. And I, I go back to that Orwellian theory. You know, Julia and Winston uh, are not to be determined how, whether they like each other by the state. Uh, I, it's part, part of my belief. If, if Julia feels she's being exploited by Winston, bad, badgered by Winston, sure, take Winston to court. But you can't have the state as the determinant of whether two people like each other or not. I, I, where are we going to stop? If you want to do that, we're going to a sexuality. Where, where do you want to stop this? And I, I just think that I just believe in the freedom of the individual uh, to, to do as but, but shouldn't their heart desires. Women, shouldn't women have the freedom to go to work without having to worry well, about their boss hitting on them? I 100% agree with you. And if, uh, but human beings, but what human beings are, the moment someone says, no, I'm not interested, don't do that, that's it. That's, that's where it stops. Mm. But, but, you know, did. but, but if... And, and well, that, so what, what's that is the differentiation. Argument, well, basically, the problem is that, by and large, in our society to this day, most bosses are men and most of the employees and subordinates who would be in this situation are women. Not all of them, but most of them. And the problem with that is freedom is really hard to have if the power between the two people who are in the relationship is not equal. Then they don't have agency. Exactly. And so the problem with bosses sleeping with their employees is, and we've seen it time and time again in corporate life, in politics, yeah. in everything you can think of... And it'll be there all, forever. It's always the woman who ends up trashed. I mean, you know, here's Emma, hasn't worked since she left. Here's Rochelle, losing the job she thought she had. The problem is that the woman, if the, if the love doesn't work out, and most loves don't, it's lovely that yours did, but most don't, um, particularly in that situation, then, unfortunately, it seems to be always the woman that pays the price. I've heard so often people say, she's going to ruin his career. I'm, I'm, I'm yet to see many men whose careers have actually been ruined. I've seen a hell of a lot of women who've had to leave the country, who've had to get other jobs, whose whole working life and ambition has been ruined. But, Jane, this but Jane, I agree with you, and that's wrong. Right? Yeah, but unfortunately... But, that's wrong. but you that... can't then say, then the ipso facto, we can have a, that human beings from this point forward will act differently well, no one's to what they did, trying... no that they did in Aztec temples. No one's actually... As long as you've got two people who are attracted no to you... No-one's actually trying to say that from this point on, no human beings are ever allowed to be attracted to each other. But I think that if a boss and an employee find themselves in that situation, it is beholden to the boss to, first of all, disclose this publicly to his employer or her employer, to make this clear and above board and to make sure that, therefore, the, the organisation can take steps to change the dynamic. Because one of the other problems that happen if you've got a romance in an office situation is other people working around who don't know who to talk... Who's getting favours, who's getting yeah. promoted over someone else, who's getting opportunities. It's very messy okay, in the world. Can I, can I, I, I think this is the can point, I, isn't can it? I come... it's, about, it's not about making a moral judgement. No. This is about a workplace... But... Uh, and this is about workplace standards. And I think the point Jane makes is a, is a very reasonable one. Whichever way you'd look at it, things can go awry in, in such a situation. I... And, and we need to create a workplace whereby we actually get on with the job that we're meant to be doing. And for every second that we talk about this, we're not actually doing the work that the Australian but... people want us to do in the parliament. And that really disturbs me. So I think we do need some structural mechanisms to make sure uh, that we have, A, a safe workplace. That's fundamental. There, there should never be sexual harassment that goes unchecked. We absolutely need to have a process for that. But likewise, if, as you say, Barnaby, there is, is mutual attraction, these things happen, mm. then make the right steps. Yeah, I, so, I, 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 Helen, I, Helen, I, the boss of Nine, uh, who has stepped down this weekend, did he do the right thing? He a, was in, is in a relationship with a, a former colleague. She's left the business, as it's been reported. There's no question about harassment or consent or any of those sorts of things. He's left the job because of that relationship. Is that what he needed to do? 
I think we're seeing corporate Australia are going to start to take the lead on this kind of behaviour. And I think that in the case with our parliamentarians and the males that have been on Four Corners and, and what have you, they've been married. Men and women will mm. fall in love at work. You know, if you go and survey half the country and ask people where they met, by and large, a lot of people meet in the workplace. Um, Catherine Lumby had a really good article this week talking about um, what should happen when you do find yourself in that mm. situation. I think when we talk about the men in politics that we've, we've, you know, that have been in the media this week, they are married men. So there is a different, um, there is a different set of integrity and a, and a different set of eyes that we're looking at those relationships with. Um, when it comes to um, to bosses and and that power imbalance, that's that is it is critical that um, those things are managed and managed appropriately. Um, Hugh Marks stepped down, but what I did notice from that reporting, again, which we talked about at the beginning of the show, is the way Alexis was, you know, a massive photograph in the paper, her photo, you know, adorned three quarters of that page, and his headshot was the only thing that we saw of him. So again, we're saying, you know, here's this woman, she's had this relationship, and we're going to hold her out as the responsible one. And it was the same in, um, in Vicky's case, who I have a lot of admiration for. Um, where that photo by the Daily Telegraph of her being pregnant, as though this was all her responsibility. So we're seeing, you know, three, two years ago when that came out, Vicky's held up as the person who, who should be, you know, accountable for this. And then the same on the weekend with the, the Hugh Marks um, case. I think that... Um, and I said this. I said as much as this in in the uh, opinion piece that I wrote last week. We're going to start to see um, other other areas of Australia, the NRL, dare I say it, have a better code of conduct than what we hold our nation's leaders to, and that is really really disappointing. Can I just say, in prom promulgating your argument, you sort of fall over in the first section of your thesis. That is, you say that. Of course uh, I do. On, just wait up, Anna. Just with, with when you say that there must be a disclosure, as Helen said. As it, and you, and it, there was inferred in there that the guy needs to disclose it. What the about what, what about the woman's right to say whether she wants it disclosed or not? We seem to have completely ignored that, Pete. Right. In the workplace, I think it has to be disclosed. So who discloses it? The who, boss, who's responsible? The person with the power. So, so the boss has to disclose it. Yeah, I think so. Against the right, against the right of the woman, whether she wants it. Well, to or that they have to work it out. Some, or they have. Well, to hang on. How do you do that? They have to do it because it can't How, continue. What, what right does what right does a oh, woman have? Oh, what a tangled web we weave what, what when right? first we no, no, answer, to an, the You've got to answer the question. What right does a woman have? Have to answer your question. You're uh, not what right does a woman have to disclose it or not? Ah. <laughs> uh, she can disclose it if she wants to or not. Well, but she, the boss. If he discloses it, she's obviously disclosing for her, hasn't she? Barney. You do need to let people answer your questions I'm if you're you going answer. to ask them. So the, qu the answer to that is, if the boss is a boss and is employed in that uh, position, they have a duty of care to their staff. So they actually have a responsibility both to the people they employ and to the people who employ them. That is their job. So, to they it. so Jane, they disclose it over the woman's right to say, no, I don't they, want to Or they say, or the relationship ends. Either we can be open on, and honest on, Jane, about this, you, or it ends. Can you please answer to me, what is the woman's right Barnaby, to whether it's disclosed gonna, or not? I'm going to pull you up there, Barnaby. As I... an employee in an affair with her boss, he has a duty of care to his employer and his employees. It needs to be disclosed. She does. She can d disclose so bugger it her, too. Just disclose it. No. Okay, folks. We've got a guest standing it's by in the Netherlands. His name's Rutger Bregman. <laughs> He's listening into this rather Are extraordinary conversation from a very long way away. What do you make of of the discussion you're hearing tonight? Well, it really makes me think about the power of shame. Uh, there was one really worrying phenomenon in modern politics that you know I often like to call survival of the shameless where somehow the people who don't really feel shame anymore uh, come out on top and almost always, you know, they're men. If you think about human nature, it's really unique that uh, we have this ability to feel shame. We're one of the only animals in the whole animal kingdom with the ability to blush, for example. But then if you think about our political leaders or our corporate leaders, well, you can't really imagine them blushing anymore. So... Yeah, we, I think we really need to have this fundamental discussion about shame because on the one hand, we see this toxic shaming of quite vulnerable people and on the other hand, we see a whole political class who just can't be shamed anymore, you know? We can't even imagine them blushing anymore. So I think that's, that's sort of the, the deeper question here.
Okay, let's and I think. Um, I think in my case, sorry, just to, to go on what Rutgers was saying is that this slut shaming that, that I sued for and that Sarah Hansen Young sued for in the same year. Uh, in our workplaces um, is used to undermine women. And, and, and I, I agree that um, that's, uh, silence is the oxygen of shame. So when you can't speak up and when you can't go forward, and certainly over my career in the Labor Party, I took, um, I took forward many complaints of being slut shamed in public, in those public hallways well before it even reached the front page. I took it to general secretaries. I took it to um, the leader of, um, of, of my caucus. I took it to the deputy opposition leader at the time because I said this has to stop. It has to stop. It can't go on. All of this is rumour. It's innuendo. None of it's true. And there was nothing of which could be done. Now, two of those blokes that were involved in that shaming and in that undermining of me and my career have gone on to be promoted within the Labor Party, um, which is, you know, just an absurd way um, for our progressive party in this country to be treating the women that it so readily invites into, um, you know, take those seats at the table. And until we figure out how to do that, um, Rutger's right, we're going to have a group of, a cohort of people that are completely shameless and it by and large seems to favour um, the fellas. But I, I will point out Michaelia Cash's... Um, absolute incredible slur um, in, in, in the Senate when she sort of, uh, you know, cast aspersions over every single woman that worked uh, for the Leader of the Opposition at the time. OK. Um, so I, I think that that's, it's, it's a really important distinction.